So did anyone manage to come up with an answer? What links those 10 pictures? Or it could be other ones, but what can connect them? What could connect them? Trends, okay, that's true. I don't know, trends, chocolate cake, is that trending? Pardon? Always, yeah. At dinner time, it's always trending. <laughs> Sasha did actually give a, an answer in one of his answers. <laughs> when you talked about the phone. Yeah. <laughs> so they're all things, uh, well, I would say the connection between all of them, and you could put other, ca other pictures in that category, is they're all things that take up our time, not just that, but they're all things that, that we can get hooked on. Coffee, caffeine, and, and chocolate cake, sugar, they're always in the news about how we can get hooked on caffeine and sugar. Um, we get, uh, and we know some of the things are like the, the dangers of those things, it's like a modern day uh, issue, isn't it? Caffeine and sugar gets you through the day. But then also you can get hooked on uh, work, workaholics. You can get spend lots of time at work. That's the chair that was supposed to represent you. We spend phones and social media and Netflix. How much time do we spend on our phones? Just because, I don't know, there is no reason, is it? We just do. How many of you have ever been in a queue or on a bus or on a train and just noticed how many people are just on their phones? For no real reason. They're just people on the phone. So I, I do it all the time, and I'm trying to stop myself from doing it. I don't know. Anyone else do it? Anyone else just get the phones out for no real reason? Just because you, I don't know, because you're bored, perhaps. Um, and so Facebook, Instagram, social media, etc., Netflix. Uh, the microphone. We can get addicted to, we can get hooked on attention, being the center of attention all the time. We, we want to have the microphone. We want to have people to look at us and to see us all the time. I don't know if it's friend, with friends, with other people. Uh, we can get hooked on church. Interesting. So there's lots of things I could have put in that category of pictures. Some of, I didn't put the obvious ones in there, like the ones that we always talk about when we think about what, what we get hooked on, but put some other ones. Because we can get hooked on anything, actually. We can get hooked on anything. And getting hooked on... Something is another word for addictions. So we can get addicted to any of these things. And that's what I'm going to be talking about for this week and next week as well. So what all the questions to do with addiction, what it is, how we get addicted to things, why we get addicted to things, and then uh, the hope and recovery and, and uh, freedom, kind of a two-step, two-part two sermon next week as well. So... What is addiction then? Well, if you were to define it, some would be a psychology definition would be any kind of compulsive behavior, anything that we do. It's an action. It's, sorry, Jared, hang on for that one. It's an action. It's something you do. Something you, it's a habit, something you do regularly. So if it's once a year, it's not really an addiction. If it's once a week, if it's every day, if it's every 10 minutes, that's an addiction. And it's something that you it's a habitual compulsive behavior that removes your freedom of choice. So it basically is something you can't say no to, something you can't stop, something you have to have. It's the difference between the, the kind of the coffee thing. It's the difference between waking up in the morning and thinking, oh, I'm going to have an orange juice today, I'm going to have a water, I'm going to have a tea, to I definitely need to get my caffeine fix. I have to have my caffeine in the morning. That's kind of the difference, something you can't say no to, something you have a choice about, Something you can't say no to, that's an addiction. And all those things, that, all those pictures, you, some, some of us might be in a situation where we can't say no to some of those items. Anyone have a sugar addiction? Or anyone want to admit to having one? <laughs> At work, where well, I work on Fridays, we have Donut Friday. And that is a bad, I mean, good day for sugar addictions. And they also have apples as well, but I mean... Why? Why would you have apples? The apples are still there on Monday morning, which is surprising. Darling, can you go and sit down? Pete, can you go and sit down, please? Hey. 
So uh, we're talking about that. And that you can link that to any of those pictures on there. Freedom of choice. Are you free to choose what, um, what you want to have, what you, your actions, or are you stuck? Uh, and you, you have to have that fix. You have to have that, whatever it is. Otherwise, and the other thing you notice about, with, about uh, addictions, the other thing to tell that what between whether you're free or whether you are addicted is that you suffer withdrawal symptoms. If you don't get that fixed, if you don't get that caffeine, if you don't get that sugar, if you don't, uh, I don't know, go on social media, if you don't watch something, if you don't exercise in the day, you get some kind of withdrawal symptoms, you get a bit agitated, you get a bit aggy, you get frustrated easily, you don't feel as calm and relaxed and you feel more tense, something along those lines. You feel some kind of withdrawal symptoms when you don't have that. And so we're going to be looking at that and today and next week. So all those things that we put up, they're kind of mild. I suppose most of us suffer from mild addictions to any of those things, those 10 pictures of some of them. But there's other things, there's other addictions that we can suffer from. And before uh, I go in and, and share some, I don't know, share some of my story, I wanted to just put... Uh, so I've got a phone here, and I want to make this a conversation. Uh, it's not, I don't want it to just be a monologue, a sermon. So I'd really like if you guys got involved. Uh, I'll check, them, check the phone. It's anonymous, so there's, you know, if you don't want to put your name, you don't have to, and I won't know who it is. But uh, anything that I talk about, anything I mention, uh, if you want to put a comment, if you want to text a question, if you want to share... I don't know, maybe that something the same experience has happened to you or you know of something like that or it, it connects with you or there's a prayer that you want to share and be part of the conversation and, and the dialogue, then please, uh, that number will be, Jared, just put that number some, every now and again on the screen. Um, and I'll check my phone. Remember, it's anonymous, so if you, don't have to, if you don't want to put your name, you don't have to. So, talking about addictions. I can remember the day that it began. I was about 11 or 12. I was in school. I was just, you know, normal kid in school, 11 or 12, and started the first year of secondary school. And uh, I was, we were in an IT class, so we had an IT lesson, and we were just there doing our work, as you were, you just, and class was normal, nothing unusual about it. And I think with the last 10 minutes of the lesson, we were just finishing off whatever it was, and the teacher wasn't really paying attention. Uh, and we were, I don't know, just doing whatever we were doing on the computers. And then, uh, last 10 minutes of the lesson, a couple of friends that I was sitting next to, they, uh, well, one of my friends asked me a question. And this is back in the day when computers and the internet were new, and we didn't really know, I wasn't really experienced with these things. So he says to me, uh, why don't you go onto the internet and uh, search for this lady? She's my auntie. I was like, okay. Um, I, I just believed him. I did it. didn't really know. Well, I guess believed it. But uh, what I didn't realize was that they'd have a little conversation. Uh, it, the name, and they were, it was a little bit of a joke that they were playing with me because I wasn't, you know, 11, 12 year old, you're not really experienced in the internet back in those days when you didn't have smartphones and free wireless internet everywhere. And the only real access you had to the internet was in school. So I was kind of a bit naive about the whole thing. Um, and they'd had a little joke and come up with this name. And so I typed it in, thinking that it was my friend's auntie. It turns out it wasn't his auntie. It turns out this name he had given me was the name uh, of a page three model. So you can imagine the kind of pictures that came up. I blame the school internet. It's their fault. They should have filtered it all. But you can imagine the kind of pictures that come up. And I was like, by the time I'd realized what happened, I quickly closed it down. And it was a bit, they were laughing. I was a bit embarrassed. But I don't think the teacher saw it, so that was fine. It's not fine, no. Um, and so I closed it down. It was probably on there. The pictures were probably on there for, I don't know, three, four, five seconds. And I closed it down straight away when I realized what it was. And they were laughing, and I was a bit embarrassed. But they stayed in here. Things that I saw of, as an 11, 12-year-old, I never 
seen those kinds of pictures before, particularly back in those days when internet and things weren't as freely available as they are now. You don't encounter those kinds of pictures uh, as often, as frequently as you might do now, where they're everywhere, in adverts, in films, in, in, on TV, they're everywhere all the time. Back in those days, you didn't encounter them, and those pictures stayed uh, in here. And although I only saw those pictures for, I don't know, a couple of seconds, something in my brain just clicked and became a kind of like a fascination. I had to go back and, and when I had the chance to find more time to go back and search those things again, I did. And this was back in the day, like I said, when internet wasn't as freely available and it was all on dial-up. I don't know if you remember dial-up. And so access to the internet wasn't as frequent for me. And so being able to look at these pictures and find these things wasn't a, a regular thing at the start. But the more I did it, the more frequent and the more regular it became, as regular as it could be. And gradually, over the next couple of weeks and months, as I had more exposure and I couldn't, I got to a stage where I couldn't stop myself from going back and searching these things when I had the opportunity and I became hooked and I became addicted. And it, again, so addiction is something that overwhelms you, it overpowers you, you can't say no to it. And that's what it became over the next few weeks and months in that first, maybe I was, I was probably 12 at the time. But by the age of 12, yes, I was definitely addicted to going onto the internet and searching for these things. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. And if you're not sure, if you're wondering kind of the extent to how to put some context into all this, the extent to which this is incredibly rife. Uh, so those, those pictures that we had, they had Netflix on there, we had uh, Apple phone on there, these Netflix, I don't need to go back, it's fine. Netflix, Apple, Google, Microsoft, all these massive companies, if you combine them all and put their, all their revenues together, you wouldn't get the same revenue that this particular industry makes in one year. It's insane. Did you know that? Our, particularly now in the, in the days of Netflix and Amazon Prime and iPlayer, with all the stuff that's downloaded every day and streamed every day, 35% of the stuff that's downloaded is to do with this particular industry. It, it's everywhere. And we know it's everywhere. It's in church. It's outside of church. Uh, and it affects everyone in some way. And it's huge. In fact, the title of my sermon, it's a $13 billion industry per year this particular industry, the one I was addicted to. It's huge. So, continuing with my story, it's, addictions have costs. They don't come free. They're not cheap. They have costs. And for me, as a kid, I didn't have a lot of money, but uh, obviously as a teenager, you don't have a huge amount of money. But when you become addicted to something, and I think it's the same with anything, you end up putting your, your money into that addiction. I spent too much money putting internet on my phone, topping up, you know, those, those days when you topped up, to carry on with my addiction. And I spent too much money. But it also comes with a cost. It comes with, a, that's a financial cost and a practical cost. It comes also with a spiritual and emotional cost. And for me, I don't know if the same, is, probably the same with other addictions, but there's, you go through this kind of like a, a, a Guilt cycle. I call it a guilt cycle. You, you know you shouldn't be doing this. You know it's wrong. But you have no power. You're overwhelmed. You're, you're overpowered by whatever this, this pull, this temptation, this force to go back and do what it is that you know you shouldn't be doing, but you, ha you do it anyway. And so I would go back and do and, and give in to my addiction. But then I, afterwards I'd feel so guilty and ruined and wretched and awful, and I'll be praying for forgiveness, and I'm sure God did forgive me, but then a couple of, uh, the next day I'd still feel guilty, 
Day later, I'd feel a little bit better, thinking, yes, I can get through this. this is, that was the last time. That was, that was it. That was the end. I'm not going to do that again. I'm free. And another day later, I'd be like, yes, another day's gone by. I've made it. And gradually, a couple of days later, you, kind of, you get complacent and straight back into the addiction. I think it's the same with other addictions. It's like a guilt cycle. Your emotions go around. And, and what happens is they become all-consuming because all your effort, all your energy, all your time is spent either managing the addiction, either hiding from it, either hiding other people from it, either trying to hide yourself from it, or dealing with those emotions on the inside, which you can't quite, which you can't obviously tell anyone about because things are secret, addictions are secret. So you have to kind of spend all your time and energy dealing and 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 repressing and hiding all these things, and so you end up suffering. And yeah, I struggled um, socially and emotionally and spiritually, because I was spent all my time dealing with this addiction that I couldn't stop. And it continued, continued for years. It's like a cycle of guilt. Did you know also that when you, I'm not a neuroscientist, but when you get addicted to something, you, every time you make a decision, you make a pathway in your brain. So you link two things together. So in your brain, if you choose to do something and it has a particular outcome or a particular effect, you link those two parts in your brain together. So you make a pathway, a link, a road between those two things in your brain. And every time you choose to do something, every time you choose to do that thing again, you strengthen that pathway, you strengthen that link, become stronger. So say at first, maybe an addiction might be between something you do, a particular action, and a pleasurable emotional response. So it's a short link between two small things in the brain. But then over time, you keep doing it, you keep doing it, that road becomes stronger, that path becomes stronger. And what happens is in the brain, the cells actually adapt. They change. They get used to something that happens regularly. And they think that's the normal thing for you to do. They think that the cells in your brain think that that's normal, think that that's the way that every day should be. And so actually, because the pathway is so strong, they're used to it, it's, it's a regular occurrence. Actually, if you then stop, if you try and actually stop an addiction, then your brain cells literally scream for you to carry on. They're so used to whatever it is, they're so used to that, that, that behavior, that pathway in the brain, that, that link together, they're so used to it that they literally scream for you to carry on. Your brain cells work against you to, 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 to stop addictions. They actually work against you. And so you're, you're so overpowered, your brain can't even deal with it. And so you have to go back and you keep going back because you can't say no, because you're overwhelmed. And that's what happens. That's what and how addictions, that's how they form, that's what they are. That's how, you, how they manifest themselves. But... The question is why? Why do, you get, why do we as human beings get hooked on things? Why do we get hooked on things so easily as well? Well, one of the things I want to point out, one of the, if you, uh, you know, one of the things that I want to point out, and this is something that we get wrong in church quite a lot actually, I think, is that addictions are not the problem. Addictions are not the problem. The behavior is not the problem. Addictions are a symptom of a much, much deeper problem, which is in here. The behavior that you do for whatever addiction it is, whether it's for me, like me using the internet for inappropriate things, whether it's caffeine, whether it's exercise all the time, whatever it might be, that's not the actual problem. It's just a symptom of a much, much deeper problem, which is in here. It's a symptom of deep, heartfelt questions, deep questions, deep psychological identifying questions that... Like, who am I? What am I about? What's my life? And the questions that we just don't have answers to. And so we search for them and we long for answers to them. But, but we go to the wrong place, basically. We go to the wrong place. We take our questions 
Those questions that we longed for, that we want answers to. Who am I? What's my purpose in life? Am I loved? Am I valuable? Am I worthy? Does somebody care for me? Does somebody want me as a human being to be in their life, to be a, a friend, to be a family member? Does somebody want me? We take those questions if they're unanswered and we go to places that we think are going to answer the questions. Or they do answer the questions for five minutes, but they don't give a long-term fulfillment. And so we get hooked. And we keep going back for those quick, short fixes to those questions. And I think, you know, there's a whole range of these questions. And some of us, usually, what happens is one of, it's usually one question that gets us. It's one question that keeps reoccurring. It's maybe the who am I question. Maybe it's the what is my purpose in life. Maybe it's the am I a loved, am I loved question. Maybe it's am I worthy of somebody's love question. Maybe is it, um, is somebody intimate? Does somebody know me? Really know me? Does somebody want me? And for me, I think the question, the search that led, the search going on behind the scenes in my heart and my soul, going on behind the scenes for all this, which was led, what led to what happened, um, was a quest and a search for intimacy. I don't mean physical intimacy. I mean, true openness, true honesty. Somebody just to be a friend, a real friend, like an open, honest relationship where you tell people, you tell somebody everything that's on your heart and they tell you, and, and there's an intimate relationship. It can be an intimate friendship, an intimate mentoring relationship, marriage, some kind of intimacy. We long for somebody to know us and just to accept us for who we are. And I think that's what, that's the question that I was searching for. Longing for intimacy, longing for somebody to really know me and to accept me. And what happens is those things, what I saw, and my brain connected that with that question, and I was gone. I had no, no hope, basically. That was, my brain had, had ruined me, basically. And ruin any chances of being able to get out of that addiction because it linked what those pictures and videos, etc., were about with someone being intimate and someone loving me. And we do that with addictions. And actually, whether some, some people that might be that, some people might, addictions might start as a kind of coping mechanism for, for events in their life that are outside of their control and you can't, you can't handle them. Something that's happened and you can't handle it, so you turn to something to give you rest or to give you relaxation or to, to take your mind off something. And that's how maybe an addiction might start. Or it might be, you know, you might be repressing some kind of painful event that's happened in your past and something you haven't quite come to terms with. And so you start an addiction or you look for something that gives you, takes your mind off away from whatever it might be that's worrying you or concerning you or frustrating you. And so you turn to that and it becomes an addiction. But whichever the circumstance, whichever one, one of those it is, the underlying concept is always the same. And it's always that there is a void, a hole, a gap, a missing piece, an unanswered question here in your heart. It could be emotional, it could be spiritual, it could be psychological, it could be practical. Maybe there's a missing person in your life that never showed up could be an emotional question that you've never got answered. It could be a void, a void of intimacy, a void of love, a void of connection, a void of relationships in some way. And it happens to all of us. It happens to all of us. And every one of us, I'm sure, in some way is addicted to something or was at one stage addicted to something or took, maybe if we never got to a full-scale addiction, we took those questions and we thought that something else was going to answer those questions for us. We thought something else, maybe it's work, workaholism. We think work is our purpose in life, so we just keep doing it and we keep doing it because that's what makes us who we are. And we keep working, even though everyone else and, all, and, and we're suffering. We just keep doing it because we get addicted to it and we think it gives us that purpose and that calling. We think that's what our... we think we. That, connect it onto work, or we connect it onto anything else. And we all, we all get into a mess. 
we all get into mess, really. And like I said, because we all get into this, we all have these pathways in our brain that are linked between something that we end up addicted to, and we have these pathways. And actually, these pathways in the brain, they, you can't erase them. You can't do a control of delete and change your brain. They're there forever. They're pathways in your brain. Your brain doesn't change. It, it, what are you, how you form your brain by your choices, it doesn't change. And so those pathways, those connections in the brain that you've made between a particular action and a response or an addiction, it doesn't go away. It's there for the rest of your life. And so even for me, those pathways in my brain are still there. I have to deal with them. I have to come to terms with them. And they leave scars. And unless you manage those scars, they never you keep revisiting that pathway. And it might not look the same. And I'll talk about that next week. Uh, how addictions, we think we've overcome something. We think we've done it. We think we've overcome particularly nasty addiction. And actually what we've done is we've just displaced it. We've taken that pathway in the brain and we've just changed it to work instead. And we think we've overcome something, but actually we've become addicted to something else in the same way. So we displace, we can displace our addictions. But then if we're all like this, if we're all in this kind of boat together, if we're all hooked and we're all addicted to something, we're all suffering with the same symptoms, we're all suffering with the same unanswered questions. The question is then, were we created that way? Were we made to all be addicts? I don't know, were we? What do you think? Were we created to all be addicts? Were we made just to be overruled and overpowered by everything? Or by some kind of force and pull that, that leads us away from maybe the things that we actually want to do? And Paul talks about it. He says, the things I want to do, I, don't, I can't do. And the things I, do want to, I don't want to do, I end up doing. I have no control over it. He's talking about an addiction. Or it might be. He's using addiction language anyway. He, even he suffered with the same kinds of things as I'm talking about. Well... The answer is no. Fortunately, the answer is no. We weren't, we weren't created that way. And I want to go back and reread the scripture reading, uh, if you wouldn't mind. Second Corinthians five. So from now on. From now on, we regard no one from a human point of view, from the flesh. Even though once we regarded, we looked at Jesus or Christ from the flesh, we don't, from a human point of view, we no longer look at him in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, if anyone is in Jesus, if anyone is in a relationship with God, there is a new creation. The old has passed away and the new has come. To be really free of addictions, and I'm going to unpack this, you have, to have, you have to be a new creation. You have to be completely transformed, completely restored, completely remade by God. So God restores us and God remakes us. And I'm not talking about, by the way, this is not talking about heaven. This is talking about now. But how and why does God do that? And it says, all this is from God through Jesus reconciled himself to us. He reconciled himself to us. To us. I'm just going to stay on that for a minute. He reconciled himself to us. That means he took the first step. He initiated the reconciliation. He made the plans. He carried them out. It wasn't us. We, as we kind of analyzed and diagnosed ourselves, we're in our addictive state. We're hooked on something. We're and when we are addicted to something, what we actually do is that we give our whole self. Our, it's all consuming. We're overpowered by whatever it might be, that pull, that force, that temptation, that thing, that object. And we, we, we basically worship it because we can't get out of it. We basically worship whatever it is that we're addicted to. And it becomes to us, it's a real power, but it's a false god. 
And it becomes like a false god in our lives. We worship this thing, whatever it might be, and we spend all our time, all our energy, money perhaps, life, time, focusing on this, whatever, on this addiction. God reconciled himself to us. We couldn't do anything about it. We were stuck in our addictive state. How did God do that? Well, in, in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, it says that while we were still sinners, that means why we were still sinning, and just to make it clear, the, just to kind of unpack this a bit more, when we're talking about sinning, we're not talking about just telling a lie here and there. We're not talking about just the odd wrong action. Sin, biblically, means when we give ourselves over to some kind of force, power, pull, temptation, whatever it is that we can't get out of. When we give our lives over to something that we can't say no to. Sin biblically means addiction. It means giving ourselves over to a false god, to some kind of force or power or temptation that we can't say no to. While we were stuck, while we were rebelling against God, while we were still while we were worshiping these false gods, while we were giving our lives over to things that just destroy us. The verse Romans 5 verse 8 says, Jesus died for us says Jesus died for us. And in his death, he didn't just, we, we kind of know that Jesus died for us and we know that he paid the price for our sins on the cross and he gave us a clean start and he took our sins away. But also, one of the other things that Jesus did when he died on the cross was that he defeated the powers that hold us, that keep us addicted to something. His death meant that the most powerful force in the universe. Do you know what that is? Something that defeats evil? It's grace. The most powerful force in the universe could be unleashed and released onto us and for us and to defeat those evil powers in the darkness that control us and that we give ourselves over to. That's what Jesus' death was all about. It was about defeating the powers, defeating the control that things had on our lives. And it wasn't just about wiping our slate clean and giving us a fresh start. It was more than that. It was a deeper victory than that. That's what Jesus' death was all about. While we were still sinners, while we were in addiction, Jesus died for us. He defeated whatever it was that we got addicted to. He defeated that. Why? Why did he do that? Because plain and simply, he loves you. There's a million verses in the Bible that say he loves you. I can quote any of them. He simply loves you. And he looked into eternity and he looked out into the future of the universe. And he saw a future that didn't include you. And he couldn't bear it. So he died. And the result of that, his death, his his sacrifice, his willingness to go to that is that we can be, we're forgiven and that we can be restored. And how that works, we're restored, we're transformed in four ways. We're restored in four ways. First of all, Jesus' death restored our relationship with God. It gives us a clean start, a clean slate, a fresh, it wipes our sins away. They're gone. Those addictions, any past events, those a list of things that we've done that we're not proud of, that we're ashamed of, that we're guilty of. He just says, don't worry about it. It's gone. It's as far away as the east is from the west, he says, because you're free. He restores that connection between God and you so that you can have that relationship with God that he wants to have with you. He restores, he forgives you, and he loves you. So Christ reconciled himself to us means that he forgives us and we can have a relationship with him. That's the first way that this restores us. The second way is that when he... So he he doesn't count our trespasses, our sins against us. And the second thing he does once he's done that is he welcomes us into his family. He welcomes us into his family. That means we get a new identity. Remember those questions that I talked about at the beginning that we all answer, we will ask ourselves, who am I? What's my purpose in life? Does somebody love me? Does somebody value me? All those questions that we have, those questions about identity, who am I? 
Jesus answers that. He gives us a new identity. He welcomes us as a son, as a daughter, as a child into his family, as a, as a friend. In the Bible, it says that we're Jesus' friends. We're Jesus' brothers and sisters. He welcomes us as a whole. Once he's forgiven and wiped our sins away, he welcomes us and gives us a new identity. And with that, verse 20, that other question about what is my, what's my purpose in life? What's the point of me existing? Why do I exist at all? Is that we get a new role. God gives us a particular function, a, a, a thing to do in life, a point to live in. He says we are we're forgiven. We have a relationship with God restored. We're then part of his new family. We have a new identity as his son or his daughter. And we have a new role. We are, it says that, we're an ambassador for Jesus, making his appeal, God making his appeal through us. So, and this, this is this word, ambassadors. Once you get, see this, it's amazing. So, what does ambassador mean? Ambassador means to bear the image of somebody, to be a representative of someone. If you're an ambassador for the UK and you're in, I don't know, Spain, France, whatever, you have to represent the UK in everything. If you're in a meeting, if you're in... Uh, if you're at dinner, if you're in a hotel, if you're in a taxi, you have to represent the UK. Everything the UK stands for, you have to represent that wherever you are. That's what an ambassador does. There's no time off. You're always on 24-7. You're always representing the UK if you're an ambassador in another country. That's what an ambassador does. That's what an ambassador means, to bear the image, to be, to be the representative, to bear the values of somebody. Now, let's backtrack. I know I'd like it if you could see the links between this and Genesis chapter 1. Because when God created Adam and Eve, Genesis 1.27 says, God created Adam and Eve, male and female, in his image. To bear his image, to be his representative, to be his likeness on this planet. And he goes and unpacks that and he says, how do you do that? How do you bear God's image? Well, you take care of each other. You take care of the planet. You multiply. You reproduce. You're stewards of the world. You represent God's values when you deal with nature, when you deal with each other, when you deal with animals. That's what he said to Adam and Eve. Represent me. Represent my values on this planet. And obviously we know they, they, they failed big time. And so through, and the, the, that, what that meant was that the purpose of human existence was kind of lost. We we mismanaged ourselves and we lost our purpose of existence. But through Jesus' death, it says that we are now, we can be again, we can restore our original intention. When God created us, he created us to be an ambassador, to bear his image. Originally, in the Garden of Eden, when he created, when he thought of you, he thought of you to bear his image. And through his death, we can get that, we can have that task, that role, that function again. And that's, how the whole thing fits together, how the whole Bible fits together is that God created Adam and Eve. He gave them a function. They mismanaged it and they lost it. And Jesus put a plan together to get the function of human beings back. That was, the, that was another thing of Jesus' death, to defeat the powers and the reign over our lives, but also to give you a point to existence. He didn't just fit you for heaven as the uh, carol says. He created you. He restored you for a point in this world. He gave you hands and feet and eyes and ears to be on this planet, to have a role, to have a function on this planet. And that's what this, this, this section is talking about, that you are now God's... If you have a relationship with God, you're his ambassador. You, you live for him. What do ambassadors do? They represent God. You represent the true king. You represent God's values. You represent what God's kingdom looks like, wherever you are. Now, that, that can mean whatever job you have. That can mean whatever country you're in. That can mean whatever age you are. It's not a job like that you do nine to five and you go home at the end of the day. It's a, it's a, a function, a calling, a vocation, something you do all the time, whether you're at home with family, whether you're at work, wherever you work. You can pick up, you can be God's ambassador. And that's how awesome this is. It's not, a, it's not a selective few. 
God didn't just call five people. He didn't just call 12 people. He didn't just call a particular denomination of Christianity. He called anyone to be his ambassador. So he gives you, he restores your relationship, he gives you a new identity, and he gives you a role. And, he, and through all that, he calls you up into a bigger story. The last verse says, into his righteousness. And that basically means his story of putting the world right. He calls you into that. You're part of that. You're not part of a small, insignificant story anymore. You're part of a bigger picture, a universal picture, a story that has no beginning and no end because its author has no beginning and no end. You're part of that. So, through restoration, he, he gives us a new relationship with him. He restores, he wipes our slate clean, he gives us a new start. He gives us a new identity as his son and daughter. He gives us a new role as his ambassador. And he give, makes us part of a bigger, wider, larger story than we could ever imagine. Four ways that he restores us. So my question to you is simply, where do you see yourself? How do you respond to all that? Do you see, do you, do you see yourself like I used to and addicted to something? Maybe you know that. Do you see yourself as part of God's wider plan? Or do you see yourself as a small, in a small, insignificant local story? Do you see yourself as of having a relationship, a restored relationship with God? Or do you, see, do you see yourself wanting that and yearning for that and asking for that? Do you see yourself as having a point to life? Do you see yourself as always questioning, Am I, is this what I should be doing? What's my point in existence? Or do you, self being God, do you see yourself being God's ambassador? Whatever you are, whatever job you have, whatever location you're in, do you see yourself as God's ambassador? Or do you self, see yourself as having... No real existence, no real point to life. Where do you see yourself? How do you respond? Ask yourself those questions because only if you ask yourself your questions, then you can really think and, and come to God and come to Jesus and say, actually, you know what? I want a fresh start. I want to accept your forgiveness. I want to accept your love. You can come and say sorry. You can come and say, I know I'm in an addictive or I know I'm in a, in a messed up state but God still loves you, and that's the biggest thing. Whatever state you're in, God still loves you. And you can come to God with those questions and let him answer you and let him restore you and let him transform you on this planet now for the future, for now. Not for some distant time in another life, but for now. Let him restore you for this life, for your future, for the next 10 years. Let him restore you. Let him transform you. Let him remake you into that new creation, into the original creation that he made when he thought of you. Let him have that authority. So that's my question. Where do you, how do you respond? Are you going to let God forgive you? Are you going to get, let God love you? Are you going to let God give you the purpose he intended? Or are you going to carry on searching for answers for those questions in places that don't really fulfill. So, as we close and as we sing the last song, think about those questions. Where do you, how do you respond? What's your, what's your response to God when he offers all these things? How do you respond?